While we're waiting, good morning. Um, you guys have present, seen uh, several sessions this week, if you've been to this entire track, on data, how to use it, what NI is offering in terms of data. So here, myself and John Zukowski are really just gonna try and tie it all together. And we're gonna do that by talking about what NI does within our own manufacturing organization. So first, my name is Mark Moyer. I'm the Applications Director within NI focused on product analytics. Um, I joined the company about two years ago with the purchase of Optimal Plus. With that, opt with that entire, in that entire time, I've really been with the company five years focused on product analytics software. Uh, John here is our Industrial Engineering Director within NI Manufacturing. So John, introduce yourself, please. Sure. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Sikowski. Uh, I am the Director of Manufacturing Global Analytics and Industrial Engineering. Uh, this was a role that was created just uh, in January as manufacturing, we've seen a, a, a need and the timing is right to bring industrial engineering, analytics, and cost engineering all together. Uh, so uh, I've been at NI for uh, 28 years. Um, in various roles throughout manufacturing and supply chain, operations, services, process engineering, and so forth. So have a kind of a broad, uh, broad experience across the entire manufacturing spectrum within NI. Seen a lot of history. <laughs> yep. So today's discussion is really gonna be more of a discussion. We don't wanna necessarily go through a ton of slides, show a lot of product information. You're gonna see System Link and Optimal Plus on one side. The rest of this is really gonna be focused on what we've done within NI Manufacturing. What are we learning? Because we're going through that same digital transformation journey just like a lot of other companies are. So we really wanna take what we've learned and share that with you guys. Because John and I have been working on that together. So we're gonna start off really with talking about who is NI Manufacturing? Is that the right button? So John, you wanna kind of explain sure. NI Manufacturing for us? Sure, sure. So. NI manufacturing, or NI manufacturing model, we are very much a, a high mix, low volume manufacturer. Um, our product offering, I, I tend to equate it to our product offering is about a meter wide and a couple centimeters deep. Um, and that type of business model lends itself to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, small lot size manufacturing, a lot of changeovers, driving, you know, kind of bringing down your, your efficiencies. Um, we have two factories, uh, one in Debrecen, Hungary. Uh, Debrecen is the second largest city in Hungary. It is about 40 to 50 kilometers east of the Romanian border. Uh, that, um, west of the Romanian border, excuse me. Uh, that factory opened up in 2001. Our first board rolled off in October of that year. And then Penang opened up about uh, uh, 10 years afterwards. So um, as you can see here, to take a look at some of the, the, the production data or volume from 2001, Hungary is significantly larger with regards to output with, uh, as compared to Penang. Hungary produces a lot of our, our legacy product. They have some of the higher volume product that we manufacture notably in condition uh, monitoring and also on our legacy side. Whereas Penang is focusing more on some of our higher complex products. So our micro circuits, uh, controllers and chassis and RF. Um, we, it is our policy, it's a standard product. We do not cross pollinate production between both factories. Okay, that's gonna drive up your investment portfolio in inventory and test assets and so forth. So basically our, what you see here with regards to our test stations, um, they are very centric to basically what our build strategy is. Who's building what product and where and when. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that I, I, I didn't is uh, Hungary is rapidly becoming also our, our uh, transportation center of excellence. So a lot of focus in uh, electric vehicle batteries and so forth. Um, uh, the number of test stations, when you take a look, what we have up here, it's almost equal but interesting when you look at the comparison to the volumes, like it looks a little kind of disparate. Um, as I mentioned before, manufacturing does a lot of legacy production. Legacy product I would consider basically two to three years into its maturity life cycle. Um, 
And so we have a lot of one-off type stations. And some of those stations in Hungary may be 20 years old. Okay. We actually have a bit of a, a parking lot at the, end, at the back end of the, uh, of the facility. And we use some of those stations maybe once every six months as needed. In Penang, our products are more complex. The test solutions are much more uh, complex, diverse, longer test times. So there I'm, I'm building more of the same station type over and over again. So our, our, our current uh, version of VST, I have nine test stations, the same st test station supporting those products and they're all operating at the same time. So that's that's the the one reason for the uh, for the kind of disparity when you look at the number of stations with the volume, um, the complexity that I mentioned in uh, with regards to the test stations in Penang is really the motivation to something that we're going to talk a lot about today. It's down here. It's called pivot to test. Um, uh, the complexity in our test design um, that we've rolled out into manufacturing has really become a motivation for manufacturing engineering for a very purposeful change to be focusing on manufacturing cost, test, investment, ROI on our test assets. Uh, because what we've seen is a bit of a paradigm shift in with regards to our contribution to COGS. Before it was at the, the front of the line with all of our assembly equipment and so forth. Now over the course of the last few years, it's shifted to the back end where Test is now our primary contributor to COGS, and it's also our constraint with regards to test times and throughput and output and so forth. So, so brief history then on right. where we are in manufacturing. Right, and in a lot of cases, so I deal with a lot of manufacturing companies, organizations, um, in some respects, NI is just like those. If you take a look at what we see on the right there, you see some of the, some of the KPIs we're trying to improve. We're always trying to improve first pass yield, scrap, efficiency, throughput. The where NI is a little bit different, and John alluded to it, is really because of the high mix, low volume, but also because we're delivering test in instrumentation to our customers who rely on its accuracy and precision, almost our testing is almost like validation testing and manufacturing. So this is why our test cost is so high relative to cost of goods. So this is the one slide I promise. This will have some product information on it. So, but I want to show this really as kind of what we've done in play, what we've done within NI manufacturing to drink our own champagne, you can say. So we are one of the few software companies out there that we develop the software that runs uh, that helps to run our manufacturing facility, and we ha we do manufacturing. A lot of software companies can't say can't make that same claim. So with us, we certainly have our two manufacturing facilities in Deberton and Penang. John mentioned those. We've got the same um, SMT processes in both. We've got the same module build, sub module build, and product build in effectively uh, effectively in those same facilities. So that solder prints, solder paste inspection, pick and place, all that. Same thing as you're going to see in any board manufacturing facility around the world. Uh, the functional test or inspection and functional test. Same thing. We're using Teradyne ICT. We've got a mix of, of um, suppliers that provide our equipment. We don't just use just our own equipment because we don't make everything. So we're using a lot of other people's equipment and, but we are bringing all of this into our own software tools. So we're using System Link here really for two things. First, it's a means of collecting data off of all of the equipment. Now, we can absolutely use it for the test data management, but in this case, because we're also applying Optimal Plus up top, we're bringing really that test data along with all of the assembly data into Optimal Plus, as well as, if you take a look at, we've, we've built our own data lake. Um, and that's where we're storing RMA data. That's where we're storing all the maintenance data, all of our time information, how much time is spent in each operation on the manufacturing floor. So all of that data is ultimately pulled into that one, piece, that one center of truth uh, for the data. So really this is how we've implemented um, our software stack within NI Manufacturing. So this is, I'll call it our reference uh, architecture. So John, any? Comments or thoughts? Uh, 
No, Mark, I think you, you hit on it. <laughs> I mean, you know, one of the challenges that we have seen, um, you know, this is our main conduit using system link as an API going into, into optimal plus, but it's the diversity of the data at all of these different resources, which is a challenge an opportunity. And I think if your company is going through the same type of transformation that we are, I would venture to guess that you're probably experiencing the same thing. Um, so. So that's it for the product discussion. Really what we want to focus on now is what have we learned? So first thing, and yeah, if you were here for Ron Chafee's uh, presentation just before this, you'll have seen this cycle of improvement. And when we talk about a data transformation journey, it's not a single it's not a single line. It's not something you start at point A and you go all the way to you go all the way to Z. You're going to go through many cycles as you go through this process. And what we've learned and what we've seen and what we're implementing is really you can almost think of it as a PDCA process. But first, you need to measure, identify what is the problem that you want to have solved. After that. Then you're going to go off and say, okay, what's the data that I need to solve that problem? And then you start to figure out how are you, how are you going to do that collection? Well, we put the strategy in place to leverage our existing tools. We are a data acquisition company as much as we are a test and measurement. The heart of it is really data acquisition. So collecting that information, going through, building the analytics, leveraging pre-existing analytics to go through and say, how do we find, how, can we get to the root cause? Can we identify this on a systemic basis? And then can we act on it? How do we take the action? And then wash, rinse, and repeat. Do that same cycle over and over. Measure yourself. Take a look at where you're going. And John, John is the industrial engineering manager, can speak to some specific examples and a little bit more on kind of his thoughts as the IE manager. Yeah. So looking at these four steps, um, I'm just thinking back to, you know, how we've been working on this over the course of the last year, year and a half, but also reflecting back on a, on a, on a pilot that we did about five, six years ago um, as our, our first real exposure to, to uh, analytics is I'm looking at identify as like, what we did is we just threw a wide net out there to capture all the data that we can get, whether it's test assembly and so forth. And let's push all the buttons, ring all the bells and see what we learn. And we ended up in a, in a realm of uh, analysis paralysis. We just got so bogged down because we had a lot of information. What do we do with it now? Okay. What we should have done, what we have, we're doing now is we're really prioritizing exactly what are our challenges? Where do we need to focus? Um, and then not only focus on the challenges, but also prioritize those so that you don't get bogged down. Once you do that, you lose momentum. And that's really, it's really tough to kick that back up because you start to see people kind of walking away like, okay, I'm good. No, no, no. So we're going to, we're, we're, we put together a very stringent, or uh, I guess, uh, list of priorities on how we want to go ahead and move forward. And again, really focusing on the test side. The one thing I was going to note on the collection, and I'd be interested to, to see if uh, some of the, the folks here in the crowd are seeing the same thing. Um, we utilize Oracle as our ERP system. Okay? An Oracle is a great tool for transactions, material transactions, whip transactions, cutting jobs, receiving, moving product through the floor. It doesn't do any type of analytics for us right now. And so as a result, We've been relying on a lot of homegrown, um, disparate uh, uh, analytics tools that uh, over the course of time, you know, they've served their purpose. But what we're seeing now is the needs of the business have, have superseded the capabilities of what the tools can provide. And it's that aspect of just going to this resource for first pass yield and this resource over here for failure rate and so forth, over here for throughput, very inefficient. We're actually spending upwards of 27% of our manufacturing engineering time just doing data mining. Okay. That's, uh, that's high cost. I need those engineers focusing more on strategic related activity rather than data mining. So 
one of the things that I think is, is a great uh, byproduct of what we're doing here is we're getting all of this now in a comprehensive system to where I could set up rules and alerts. I come in in the morning and all my information is, is, uh, is in my inbox. So I'm saving all that time doing all of that, that manual data mining. So I'm being able to get our engineers to be focusing more on strategic related work rather than the, the tactical mundane type work. Um, the other two analyze, we've been focusing a lot, working with the, the data engineers, the AEs, the data scientists, uh, developing customized dashboards. Uh, we're in the process of training um, super users out of both of our factories to take some of that responsibility on, but also be seen as a point of reference of expertise when somebody needs help. Uh, so that's a, uh, that's a, it's an interesting opportunity for a lot of the engineers at, uh, at our factories to kind of take their career in a bit of a different direction. Okay. So John, real quick. So you yeah. mentioned the different factories. Are the different factories using this to communicate with each other better or differently? Uh, depending upon the resource, I would say much better. So from an ICT perspective, and I know we're gonna talk about that here in a minute, right? Um, ICT has been our early adopters. They have really picked up the ball and run with this. Um, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of collaboration now on sharing information. What's working, what's not working. Try this dashboard and so forth. Uh, so there's been a lot more uh, interface between both, uh, both factories, specifically in that resource, okay? Because again, early adopters, and we are fully live with ICT now. Um, so we're seeing a lot more interface from engineer to engineer, sharing ideas, what's working, what's not working, try this, so forth. Yep. Well, so since you spoke of ICT, why don't we just go there? Sure. <laughs> So uh, I guess, we, and we can go through this a few ways. So I think the first thing, why did we pick ICT? And I'll say, when John talked about the pilot five or six years ago, it was five years ago. It was the first job when, it was the first activity that when I joined Optimal Plus, John and I met on my second day, because the pilot was uh, actually the NI pilot. So we have, we've certainly done this with many other companies. ICT is always a great starting point. But John, from your standpoint, why was ICT important uh, in this case? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, just going through the slide, the accessibility of the data is pretty straightforward. ICT data is basically log files. Very easy, easy to access, easy to read, easy to bring into the model. Uh, secondly, ICT, I don't want to skip around too much, but ICT from a cost perspective is one of the highest hourly cost of test rates that we have on our production floor. Um, very mechanical, as Mark mentioned, we've, we've uh, standardized on the Teradyne platform uh, at both of our factories, uh, but each product that runs through ICT has a very unique fixture. And those fixtures run anywhere from fourteen dollars to $15,000 each. And I have over 600 fixtures between both factories. So it is a fairly cost prohibitive resource and we use it quite extensively. And the other reason, since it's so mechanical, the amount of maintenance that we do on a, on a regular basis is, is fairly significant. Uh, we actually have four technicians across both factories dedicated solely to ICT maintenance. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, because it's, it's just from a cost perspective. And in and, and, and the end of the day, test, okay, it's, it's assuring that the product is built right, it beats specs. Okay, beyond that, what type of value is it adding? It's really adding a lot of, a lot of cost to our overall cost profile. And so far as, as much as possible, we're trying to pull back the reins on that, notably on the ICT side, which is one of the reasons why we started that first. Right, and so other benefits that you get from ICT. ICT is a great operation to look at as a standalone, but when you start pulling in other data, when you start pulling in, say, genealogy data that you can get from pick and place, now you can start to use, meld that data along with ICT data, which is measurements of those units, and say, okay, what's the performance of my suppliers? 
In a lot of cases, if you're, with a, if you're working with a CM, those CMs may use multiple suppliers and that can have an effect potentially on the quality and performance of your product. So tying two operations together to get, an, uh, to get a deeper understanding as to the performance is also another big benefit that some of our customers are taking along with that uh, when they start pulling in multiple operations into the system. So some of the analysis, and I really want to get to, I think, here, what were some of the changes that we were ultimately able to make? And I'll say, John, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we were really doing more of preventative maintenance within our ICT. We'd go in, we'd swap out all the pins. Right. Um, and those pins aren't necessarily cheap. Yeah. So we did a whole host of analysis, everything from efficiency to... Um, circuit or signal by signal uh, drifts and everything else. And ultimately we've been able to get to predictive maintenance. So now we're changing out pins. We can monitor the trends and send off alerts to the maintenance team. When we start to see things on a product by product on a board by board basis, start to drift the wrong direction. And then the maintenance technicians just go in and replace the pins that they need to. So we've, we've been able to save, um, uh, we've been able to save 70% of pin replacement since we went live with pred the predictive maintenance. As we're doing trend analysis now at the reference designated, so it's very, very granular. And we're able to see the drift over the course of time and through those trends, we're starting to establish, okay, well, what point in time do I need to do the maintenance? And to Mark's point, we can establish alerts, rules and alerts that's gonna start showing drift and I can take action before I actually drift outside the upper or lower test limit. So from that perspective, we've become a lot more efficient with regards to the way we're, we're managing maintenance on, on all of the test fixtures. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've been able to reduce, and this was a big, a big uh, area that we're really focusing on, um, retest iterations is inherent in the process. That's just, just the life of ICT. If you don't have the right connection with pin to test point, you open, open back up, maybe you scrub the board, get some flux residue off the board or what have you, put it back in, apply vacuum, do it again. And I've seen retest at ICT happen over and over. We've actually been able to reduce the retest iteration at ICT, notably in our hungry factory, uh, by 20%. So that's a lot of additional efficiency that we're putting back uh, back into the process. And as a result of that, we've been able to actually decommission one of our test stations. So we pull that off of the floor and we're using it more for development now on, on the ICT side of the engineering. We don't need it in, a, in, in manufacturing. So that's a savings of roughly about $45,000 on an annual basis because we're not paying that out to Teradyne for maintenance contract. So. Yeah, so all told between People and these are, I'd say, hard numbers. One hundred seventy-four thousand dollars just at the Hungary site alone on this one operation. So as we then now say, okay, how are we going to take this and move forward? And we'll get to that in a second. But I think at this point, um, what we wanted to do is show a video from the Hungary plant manager talking really about how this has helped him. Hello everyone. My name is Robert Hussle, Managing Director for the NI Factory in Debrecen, Hungary. As part of a Hymix low volume manufacturing operation, we have always stressed the importance of quality. Quality is a cornerstone of every improvement project to better ensure successful customer outcomes. But quality also requires efficiency. To make quality products at scale, NI must maximize the utilization of throughput of our available production assets by gaining increased visibility and transparency into their performance. This is why we strive to become a more data-centric organization to use data to better manage, plan, and execute along our quality and efficiency goal. Fortunately, as a part of NI, we have access to industry-leading solutions and expertise to set up a path to success. By implementing a continuous improvement platform based on the system link and optimal plus technologies, we have designed a factory blueprint that will be more intelligent, transparent, and efficient. Through our internal partnerships, we have already implemented a successful data pipeline to extract product data from our test assets and quickly make it available 
to key stakeholders. In addition, flexibility in the optimum plus solution has led to the creation of numerous real-time dashboards and event-driven notifications that will keep us running smoothly and provide granular analytical data to our engineers. Moving forward, we are certain that our implementation efforts now will provide an effective platform for continuous improvement and operational excellence for years to come. Finally, I would like to recognize the proficiency, guidance, and support that our NI Lifecycle Solutions team is providing on our initiative. Their combination of operational knowledge and analytics know-how has been critical to our success. Our expertise is in manufacturing, so leveraging an outside team dedicated to a data-centric mentality is critical to deploying an effective solution with long-term staying power. We are only at the beginning of our transformation journey, but the decisions we make now will have lasting impacts on our ability to operate in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy your time at I Connect, and I wish you success in your digital transformation journey. So now we're going to spend a few more minutes talking about really what's next for us um, within NI Manufacturing. So we've kind of identified three areas. Uh, John is going to talk really about the first one here because as John's mentioned before, a lot of our spend, we spend, um, I don't know, somewhat, somewhere just south of $10 million a year on test equipment. We spend much less than that on the assembly side of the world. So certainly with our manufacturing footprint, we're going to spend a lot of, we're going to really focus a lot on test. So John, you want to talk about kind of what we're doing next in the sure. test space? Sure. So this is where we get into what we're, we're calling our initiative pivot to test. Uh, and to Mark's point, you know, before I, I moved into the role I'm in now for the last, prior to six years, I was the manufacturing test engineering manager. So basically working with R&D test design on new test solution releases into manufacturing, the validation, and then the ramp up to maturity. And eventually for some of our older stations, sunsetting those solutions. So, but to Mark's point, we have seen a, a significant increase year to year with regards to the investment in test. A lot of it's due to the complex stations that we're manufacturing and the specifications we need to meet uh, uh, from a, a product spe uh, spec perspective. And the thing is, is that we typically, we're a test and measurement company. We use our own equipment in building our test stations. But the, the complexity of the products that, that we're offering are now outside some of the frequency ranges that we're able to, uh, that we can support. So now we're going to the key sites of the world, Roden Schwartz, Agilent, to buy these, you know, uh, VNAs, signal generators, signal analyzers, you know, $250,000 a pop. So our, our investment in these new solutions to support strategic product releases has just pushed us over the edge from a cost perspective. So from that perspective, last year in Q3, um, we had, we had uh, when I say we, myself, a couple of vice presidents and uh, some R&D directors, we kind of came together and said, guys, what's going to be our future state of test? How do we see ourselves going, going forward in the future? Because uh, we need to do something different. And we ended up coming up with uh, 58 aspects of what we believe our future state of test should be. Okay. Uh, then we also quantified what's our current state, what are our roadblocks? Okay. So taking all that information, um, Myself, our manufacturing engineering director, and the R&D director, we went ahead, took those 58, consolidated them down into 12 key aspects, and then put them into a, uh, a pick chart of effort and value, and we came up with these five areas that you see up here. Okay, and when you look at these five, I could see analytics embedded in each of them. Right. So what we're doing now on an analytics perspective is absolutely integral to the success of our pivot to test. And uh, I'm not going to go through all of these just given time here, but I wanted to focus on one and kind of start to get some audience participation. Um, the very first bullet. OK, one of the things that we need to do is embed a, a better understanding of financial acumen, business acumen with individuals who are actually designing these new test solutions. So what decisions are they making today that's going to impact manufacturing from a, 
a performance perspective, from a cost perspective down the road. Um, and one of the things that that's, I find very interesting is when I have conversations with R&D managers, I ask them the question, James, okay, if I reduce my test time, okay, by 20% on a specific product, what's the impact to the hourly cost of test? 20%? Nothing. Cost of test doesn't change. Yeah, because you already have the asset. Right? So you're both right, partially. Okay. <laughs> actually, theoretically, what could happen is your cost of test may actually increase. Because we use activity-based costing at, at NI, right? And that's where we're taking all of our, our, our capital costs, building, labor, you name it. How much does it cost to perform these specific type of functions? That's our, that's our numerator. The denominator is the amount of effort in order to produce that product, okay? To meet the, the revenue forecast. Now, if I reduce my test time by 20%, I'm effectively reducing the labor, the effort it's, uh, it's taking me to make that product. My denominator is getting smaller. So while the expense hasn't changed, right? I'm paying the same amount of money whether I'm using that asset 24 seven or it's sitting idle. So my cost of test has actually increased because we did the right thing by reducing the test time. Now, when we will continue to do that because in manufacturing throughput is king. We need to get product out the door. Where this does come into play, and this is key, is this now opens up opportunities to absorb additional capacity for product growth. So now I can lower my cost of test if I can put more product on that test station, right? And run more units across it. My expenses haven't changed, but now my denominator is getting bigger. And so my cost of test is actually coming down. Now that was a hard lesson for a lot of test engineers to understand. Um, we've kind of done a, a bit of a road show and gotten into some detailed explanation with examples. And they're like, all of a sudden you see the light go on, but that's using analytics. And so we're really embedding or we're, we're, we're hook, you know, hitching our wagon, so to speak, right? In order to develop a much more deeper knowledge in this area with regards to costing, the decisions that you make today from, with regards to your planning, your definition and design of test, what impact does that have to COGS, which impacts margins, which everybody should have a vested interest in, right? Later on down the road. That's what Pivot to Test is all about, is bringing to light more discovery, more knowledge, uh, so that we change decision-making, right? To optimize cost, return on investment, while not compromising throughput or quality. Okay. So, some of the other things. KPI refresh. How many folks in here actually look at their KPIs and say, are these, are these KPIs serving my needs? Are you look? Are you raise your hands? Because are you looking at things? Are you always focused on the same thing? Are you always looking to improve quality, or does it, at a different time are you looking to improve efficiency? Was there a change of management that change of management says, "Hey, we're going to focus on this instead"? One of the other areas we take a look at this year is how are we going to have the right KPIs to drive the behaviors that we want within our organization now because what the, what the behaviors we needed five years ago are different than they are now because we've got different activities, different uh, needs that we, need to, that, we need, that we have for the business. So one of the things we're looking at this year is really how do we drive, start using something like OEE. In the past, we used really some very quality-centric metrics rather than something that was looking at the effectiveness um, within our organization. So the idea of doing a KPI re, uh, refresh or KPI redesign, something that a lot of companies will go off and take a look at every few years to make sure that they're meeting the needs of the business. So we're spending some time on that, taking a look at not just redesigning them, but now how do we implement them and put rules and alerts around them so that when they go off in the wrong direction, we're flagged. 
Uh, and another point there just is it's it's not just what do we do with them, but how do we quantify the impact that those metrics have to the business? That is, that's key. Because if we're measuring something and honestly, it's not adding value, why are we doing it, right? right. So. And then the third thing is really, we talked about the ICT example and moving into predictive maintenance. Well, now let's take what we've done there and move that into other areas starting off with tests, but ultimately upstream into some of the assembly areas as well. So we're working with, uh, if, if some of you guys were within the uh, AI and ML session that Alon Malky gave, we're working with his team to put some of these algorithms in place um, so that ultimately for any test order that we have, we can quickly go off and say, here's, the, here's how we get to predictive maintenance. Okay, so but to some extent, we want to talk about what are the things we've learned. So we went through, here's, what we, here's who we are, here's what we've implemented, here's an example of what we've done with, IC, with ICT and how we're move, taking that and moving forward. But at a 30,000 foot view, what are, the big, what are the big takeaways that we've learned that we're hoping to share with you guys? And re really we see it as three pillars. There's a data aspect to it. So we'll talk about a little bit about that. There's a culture aspect to it. Nobody necessarily really loves change. So anytime you do change, anytime you start looking at how you make a change from not using so much data into purely data driven, that has a lot of impact. So we'll talk about the culture and then really what's the strategy for doing it. So I guess John, from a data standpoint, what are, what are the big takeaways from you? So if, if you've attended uh, the keynotes over the course of the last two days and also on the leadership forum on Monday, I think the message is pretty consistent. Data is king in analytics, okay? Analytics begins and ends with, with data. And uh, a hard lesson learned uh, so far with us is, is our data um, isn't either as accurate as we want it to be or there's all types of different versions and iterations of code and test architecture and so forth. Um, this, this is a, actually this kind of comes into play with an article I read in Harvard Business Review that 97% of companies out there lack basic data quality standards. Um, and we're no different. Um, I, this is one of my favorite slides and actually we could talk about this for an hour. Uh, but we won't. Uh, uh, but from a data perspective, I've, I've kind of narrowed this down into what I, I call like, like my five tenets of, of, of data must haves. It's, own, for example, ownership. Okay. Should be fairly clear as to, okay, I'm generating data at AOI, automated optical inspection. Okay. Who owns that data? Okay. If you want to stop a conversation dead in its tracks, Gather around process engineers around your AOI machine and ask them, who owns this data? That's what I did in Hungary, and it was deer in a headlight. No one had an answer. No one knew. They didn't even know where it was. Um, and that is fairly consistent across multiple different resources. Talked with the IT manager in Hungary about ICT data. He didn't know what ICT was or where this data might even reside. So this is a very commonplace problem. Uh, with regards to who actually owns the data. And then if, they, if we know who owns it, okay, then what's the process for accessibility? How easy is it to, ac uh, to access that data? Where does it reside? Is it in a, an IT firewall environment? Or is it actually on the hard drive on the resource out on your production floor? So that is, that is absolutely integral to being able to get your data. I skipped one here, management. Um, how are we managing the data? Again, kind of gets into the whole act, uh, aspect of the storage, the processes and so forth, in which we're managing it, which we're, are we archiving data? What's the whole aspect, the whole process in which we're maintaining data to uh, ensure its integrity? And then this is one that's really uh, been a, lot, a big discovery for us is consistency. So I mentioned before, <clears throat> we still manufacture a lot of, like we're manufacturing product that I used to plan when I was a product planner 20 years ago. And so we have a significant amount of uh, platforms on test architecture, uh, test code. 
And when you go from engineering group to engineering group and how they're dividing, the, the, devising their test code, very infrequently are they actually talking. Yeah. I, I would say we live the motto engineer ambitiously in we this do. space. We do. <laughs> Absolutely, we do. Um, so one of the issues that we've seen with regards to consistency that's that's been a challenge for us is I may have test code where one, one test design engineer uh, has a, sig a designated operator as OPER, whereas another test engineer in a different group designates operator OP. And so now my parsers aren't picking up all the data that I need. The issue there is that starts to generate uh, data gaps in your tool. And the issue that I'm faced with, and this is, a, this is a, a big concern of mine, is if I'm an end user and I don't have visibility into the data pipelining process and all this, these differences in code, all I see is I have data gaps in my, in my analytics solution. This isn't working. So it loses credibility with the end user when they really don't understand that the problem isn't with the analytics solution, it's with our data. So that's absolutely integral is, is really coming up with a, a, a universal data model or common data model that you're gonna use going forward. We're actually, we're working on that now with R&D test design going forward. It's not gonna help us with our data in the past, okay? but going forward, uh, aligning on a common data model is, is absolutely integral. And actually at the leadership forum, I was talking with somebody from Raytheon they brought up this challenge to me before, <laughs> before uh, I had actually had a chance to comment on it. So we are absolutely not unique in this respect. Absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. So moving on quickly to culture. So certainly, um, if you're running a manufacturing floor, if you're product engineers, you've been doing things in a lot of respects the same way for years. You use Excel. You use Jump. You use MinType. The idea that you're going to change how you do things, it's ultimately a change to your culture. So how that gets managed and how that gets propagated through an organization becomes important because ultimately you're spending money on because you know this is going to help your organization. So you want this to also be a culture changing event to some extent. You want them to pick up and run and adopt whatever data-driven methodology ultimately your organization comes up with. So making sure that there are expectations, making sure it's part of people's goals in some respects even, so that they have, hey, this is how we want to behave moving forward, and that they understand your job is gonna change. It's not going away, but it's gonna change a little bit because you're expected to do some things differently. So I think every organization that I've worked with faces that to some extent. Yep. Um, and I'm sure ours did as well. Yep. Um, actually, I was in Hungary in March at our factory doing a presentation on pivot to test, talking about analytics. And I was sitting across the table from our test engineering manager or manufacturing test engineering manager. Um, and we were all masked up. So all you could see is from the eyes above up. And as I was talking about pivot to test and analytics, I could see in his eyes uncertainty, almost bordering on fear. This was a significant change to the way he is going to manage his group. And I can see he, he's still trying to figure it out. So we talked, I pulled him aside, we had the conversation and so forth, but that's the type of reaction that you're going to get from some people. Some people are gonna really grasp it like our ICT engineers. They've taken the ball and run with it, but there, there are others that are very apprehensive. And you, know, you really have to work with some of those folks because eventually some of them are going to be your biggest advocates as far as using analytics. Right. And, and that ultimately all goes into you're the strategy for how you roll something with, like this out. Make sure that you've got buy-in at, at all levels of the organization. Make sure that it's clearly communicated the expectations, uh, that side of the world. So. Uh, with that, what I'd like to do is really um, just one minute here. So you spent uh, six sessions with us uh, in theory, uh, going through product analytics and life or life cycle analytics, learning about the test, collect, detect, detect, act framework. And ultimately the goal of this was to really tie everything together. So what you can do with machine learning, what you can do with rules, how system link comes into play, 
um, for both uh, asset management, configuration management, uh, data management uh, in the test side of the world. So pulling all of this together is really what we tried to do here within this presentation to say, this is absolutely achievable. This is how we and I are doing this and really trying to show how this can be done within our own manufacturing organization. And then really how we're going to, I think within the roadmap presentation, how we're gonna make changes based on what we're learning uh, on our own. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone here for joining today and joining uh, NI Connect this week. Mm -hmm.